Hello everyone, welcome to Super Lorcana World, one-stop shop for everything Lorcana. And we have comprehensive rules effective March 27th, 2024. Uh, this is the first chance I've had to actually sit down and read them. So we're going to go through them together. I I've seen a little bit of here and there on the internet, so I know a little bit about the rules and we'll focus in on the really important ones that I've noticed. But there's a lot of pages here, so I want to just go through it, see what's there. And uh, this will be the last video I make until after the Easter long weekend. So I hope you guys have a great Easter long weekend. And at the very least, enjoy some time off or something. Do something cool. You know, be nice. And let me know what you think about it in the comments with these rules, uh, whether or not they're good or bad for the game or anything like that. And of course, like and subscribe. That'd be pretty cool. All right, let us go here. The table of contents, table of contents, table of contents. Uh, languages. Things could get errated. Build the deck. Each player needs to track their lord totals and mark damage on characters' locations. Yep. The text of a card contradicts a game rule. The card effect supersedes that rule. That's important to know. Um, yeah. If something says draw an extra card at the start of your draw phase, then do that, I guess. If a rule or effect prevents something from happening, it supersedes everything else. Okay. And do as much as you can. If effect tells the player to do something, even if some part of that effect can't be done, that player does as much as possible. Except in specific cases. That's really cool because that's exactly how it works in Digimon. So I can get behind that. That's really, really neat. Uh, active player is a turn player. That's cool. And any, anyone the active player is playing against counts as the opponent. Uh, players can play a card whenever they're the active player and there are no effects to resolve. To play a card, the player reveals it from their hand and pays the cost. I was seeing, they, they will go into this sooner, I guess, in 4.3.3, so I'll save my big speech for them. Here they go into abilities, keywords, triggered abilities, activated abilities, static abilities, or continuous and replacement effects are generated by, some, it's generated by some kind of static condition. Okay. The bag. The bag is the zone where triggered abilities wait to resolve. Not a physical zone, but a way to picture the process of resolving triggered abilities. Think of each triggered ability as, the, as a marble in the bag and place until they're resolved. Each marble is separate from every other marble, and a player can look through the bag of marbles to select one they wish to resolve next. It's possible for each, for both the other player and the opponents to add triggered abilities to the bag at the same time. Resolving these abilities will be followed in the bag. So we'll get to the bag. Very interesting term of use for that. Uh, player's cards, yep. His cards, their cards, your cards, okay. Game state check, set conditions for the game constantly checks for. The game makes these checks at the end of every step, after an action or ability finished resolving, and after each of the effect of the bag is finished resolving. So basically, everything has to finish before the next thing can happen, which is good. Uh, and once an action is completed, a new game state check occurs. Additional ability to trigger the result of a game state check are added to the bag as soon as the check and any required actions are fully completed. So, like, the, uh, the ability and the action finishes first, and then the new thing happens in the bag. Uh, multiple render uh, actions happen at the same time. A single combined required action takes place, and all the required actions happen simultaneously. Fair enough. Uh, following game states that create a required action, if a player is 20 more lower, the player wins the game. If a player must draw from their deck with no cards, the player loses the game. The character location has damage equal to the greater willpower. That character on the location is banished. The location has damage equal to or greater than its willpower. The location is banished. Okay, great. Sounds good. And if a character in a challenge is removed from the challenge for any reason, that challenge ends. All while challenging effects and and the game proceeds. 2, 4, 3, 1, which we'll get to. Okay. And multiplayer games. I won't go into detail, but they are here. Build in the deck. 60 cards. Up to two colors. Four cards. Interestingly, I use colors and not ink. I find that really interesting considering the game is about ink and specifically has gone out of their way to not call them colors. But here they call them colors. I find that just really interesting. And no banned cards. Uh, some cards may be banned. Okay. Ban, ban list is coming. Whole new world? Watch out. I'm telling you right now. Uh, this is the starting game rules. You know, use a method, rolling a die, flipping a coin, other methods. Okay. Uh, each player randomly shuffles their deck. Player may use any form of randomization, but the method chosen must sufficiently randomize the deck. Each player must offer an opposing player a chance to cut the deck after shuffled. Cut. Cut. Not like reshuffle, apparently, but cut. Okay. Each player begins with zero lore. Use any tracking method you want. 
Uh, each player draws seven cards. Fifth, player melt to their hands. Uh, player melt to their hand only once in each game. So you can mulligan every game. Uh, you place select the kind of cards from your hand, put them on the bottom, they draw to the seven cards. Okay, very cool. And then you shuffle your card after that. Okay, nice. Love to see that. And then the game is either by lore or by deck out. Uh, that's until we get alternate win conditions, of course, which will happen eventually. Uh, turn structure is beginning phase, where all the effects of the end of the turn happen. The main phase, uh, where the player can act and perform any main phase actions. And the end of turn is the cleanup. Okay. Beginning phase, ready, set, draw. Uh, effects that would activate the start of your turn or start of your next turn end. Active player readies other cards. Set. Uh, card here that's no longer drawing will be able to quest, challenge, or exert these abilities. The active player gains lore from locations during the set phase and effects that would occur at the start of your turn and beginning of your turn and abilities triggered during the ready step right out of the bag. Okay. And then you draw. And then once something else happens, you go to the main phase. And the main phase is the same as it was. Uh, put in any order you want. Inkwell once per turn. Play a card as often as you can. Um, here it is. The first active player announces the card they intend to play, reveal from their hand. Second, the player announces how they intend to play the card, whether it's for ink or alternate cost, like shift or whatever else. The multiple alternate costs could apply. The player may choose one. The player determines the total cost of the card. Again, so if you're shifting or not depends on the ink cost. Fourth, the cost is paid. Okay. Once cost is paid, the card is now played. The character, if, a char if the card is a character, item, or location enters the play zone, if it's character played using a shift ability, it must be put on top of the card, indicated by the second step of the process. If it's an action, the effect immediately resolves and the card goes to the player's discard pile. So actions will stay on the board. The effect would trigger as a result of any steps from playing a card. The effect will wait until resolved until after the effect are fully played and resolved. I guess, for example, would be Rockstar Stitch. If you play a two drop, once the two drop is played and that's done and the cost is paid, then you can use shift to exert it to draw a card. That would be an example of that. Uh, questing is the ability to uh, gain lore. Uh, you declare that you're gonna have one of your characters quest. The other player identifies the questing character checks for any restrictions like reckless. Uh, if the effect prevents the identified character from questing, the quest is illegal. Third, the player exerts the questing character. And then you gain the lore. And effects that were occur as well as the quest are out of the bag. And then the quest is over. Fair enough. Challenge. Okay, this looks like a complicated battle phase. This looks like a really complicated battle phase. You know how Yu-Gi-Oh has the ridiculous damage step? Uh, I'm not intend. I don't believe anyone will absorb all this right away. Um, judges will have to. So I'm going to make an effort to memorize it pretty quickly and right away. So only characters can challenge. Fine. Uh, a character sent in a challenge is known as a challenging character. And the opposing character is being challenged. Great, uh, that's fine. Well, characters can challenge locations for that differences in process C4357. We will get there soon, I think. Yeah. Only challenging character as a character being challenged or the challenge. What does that sentence even mean? What the, what? What does that sentence even mean? Only a challenging character and the, and the character being challenged are in the challenge. I guess that's common sense. I don't know why anyone would think otherwise. The challenge that the player follows the steps here listed in order. First, declare characters on a chain of challenge. The second character must have been in play since the beginning of the turn. Uh, that is, they must be dry, ready, and otherwise able to challenge. The player chooses the exerting opposing character to be challenged. It checks for challenging restrictions. Fourth, challenging player ch exerts the challenging character. The challenge occurs. Sixth, while challenging effects occur. Okay, so it happens after you exert the character. That's nice. Seventh, effects that would trigger are added to the bag. Eight, once all effects in the bag are resolved, each character deals damage equal to their strength to their character. This is known as a challenge damage step. Okay. Nothing here goes in the bag. That's very, very good to know. Then determine the damage, calculate the total strength, and then take into account of any current modifier effects. After apply effects that adjust the amount of damage, like resist, the resulting damage is the final amount of damage the character deals. Fair enough. A character can have zero attack or less if the final amount is less than zero, it's treated as a zero. So no negative damage or anything like that. Once the damage is dealt, any effects that would trigger as a result of the character are out of the bag. And then once effects are resolved, effects that apply while challenging or while being challenged end and the challenge is over. Okay, and they give examples here. That's okay, that's nice. Players can choose to challenge a location. They follow the normal rules 
and stops on challenging with exceptions. While a challenger is declared, the player chooses an opposing location to challenge another character. Location is never ready or exerted. They are challenged at any time in the main phase. Location doesn't have a strength and don't deal damage to, to challenge a character. Again, pretty obvious stuff, but uh, in case it needed to be spelled out, it is here. Um, still in main phase, you can move characters to a location, and this walks through the status on how to do that. Uh, first, player moves the location to location, declares the character, remove that location. Second, the player pays the chosen cost. Uh, and the third end effects that would happen as a result of the character moving are at the back for resolution. And then the movement is complete after that. And then use other activated abilities. Uh, these are things that can exert to do things, whatever. Okay. End of turn phase. To end of turn, there are must be no abilities currently waiting to resolve. Effects that would end the turn, effects that would end at the end of the turn end, like support. Effects that would occur at the end of the turn, at the end of your turn, are abilities that are triggered by those are out of the bag. And then the cleanup, everything resolves. Once the bag is empty, the turn is ended. And then they go into cards, ready, exerted, damaged, and undamaged. Card types, characters, and it goes into the card type here, which we already know all about. So I'm not going to bother. We all know the ink already. Uh, the name, we all know this. The ink, well, yeah, we know willpower. We know all this already. Okay, we know. We know, we know, we know. Ancillary information is even here too. Actions are here. Uh, items are here. Locations are here. And you can bet they'll upgrade this uh, rule manual whenever more types of cards are added to the game. Abilities. Each clause of a card is separate effect. Each clause is separated by period. That's important. That is really, really, really important. And it even goes into very specific examples here. Like, for example, A to B. The player must complete the first part. If they're unable to, they can't perform the second part. It's, for example, deal two damage to chosen character of yours to deal two damage to another chosen character. Those are important. If you don't do A, you can't do B. And then there's A, then B. Resolve as much effects as possible. Like, draw two cards, then choose and discard two cards. You can do both. And then you have A and B. Both effects must be resolved. If one effect can't resolve for any reason, neither effect resolves. For example, choose a character of yours and gain lore equal to their uh, lore. If you don't have a character to choose, you can't gain lore, obviously. Okay, and if any ability or effect contains the word may, that player who played the card that generated the effect can choose what they want to happen. If player chooses not to have it happen, no part of the you may clause is performed. So it's not that they actually broke this down. This is really, really important. I know, I know people, myself included, had questions about this that we didn't really have a verbatim answer to, but now we do. And this tells you how to do it. There are so many cards that have like all that stuff. For example, Fairy Godmother here, you read this card. You know, whenever you play a character named Cinderella, you may exert chosen character. You know now that nothing happens. That was a really bad example. That's the only card I have on me, I think, I believe. Yeah, but I think you get my point, right? There are cards that have these clauses and get memorized how they work, which is important, but I don't think they'll be too hard. All right, uh, we have keywords, triggered abilities, activated abilities. Uh, triggered abilities occur when the trigger ignition is meant. Triggered abilities start with when, whenever, at the start of or at the end of, and then they're placed on the back. Activated abilities are abilities that a player chooses to use. They're normally written as cost and effect like most items, you know, exert, pay cost, activate the effect, for example. Uh, and if there are no effects for any resolve, the active player may use an activated ability. That's important. And then use activated ability, the active player follows these steps in order. First, the active player announces it. Second, the player determines the total cost. Third, the player pays the cost. Once the cost is paid, the ability is activated. The active player resolves the effect immediately. If an effect would trigger as a result of any of the steps to be using trigger ability, the effect wait to resolve until it the ability is resolved. Uh, what we mean by that? So activated, an activated ability can, can cause a trigger ability to activate it. Like for example, maybe you activate um, again. So I don't know. It's hard to think of an example right on the spot, you know. But let's say you activate. I don't, oh my God. You activate something that says activate this, you know, draw a card. Actually, you know what? Ursula Shell Necklace. Ursula Shell Necklace. That's, a, that's an ability that triggers based on an activated thing, right? So you have to activate the song. It's not an activated ability per se, 
but you activate the song and the trigger ability happens. That's how trigger ability works, where you pay the power to, after you play the song to draw a card. That's kind of how that works. But other activated abilities can cause other things to trigger. Like, for example, if there's a card that says you can activate a song, an activated ability to activate a song, then you can use triggered ability. Or like, insert this for any number of countless examples I'm not thinking of right at this exact moment in time. There are plenty of them, and they will come up. Trust me. Static abilities are effects that could alter the characters of a game, game rule, or game state. Things like Gontu, for instance. A floodgate. That works. That's something that affects the game state. So, there you go. Also, Bodyguard. You have to attack something with Bodyguard. That's a static ability, too. So, there's plenty of those. Replacement effects. Uh, some effects are considered replacement effects. The effects are wait for the stated condition to occur and then partially or completely placed the event. Abilities that include the word instead are replacement effects. Fair enough. Very good. Um, abilities that read as character enters as the character may enter are replacement effects. Okay. Ability modifiers. Some abilities and effects can modify the character's character. And when a new modifier is added to a applied to a card, calculation is made for that card's current characteristics, taking into account previous modifying effects that are applied to the character. It is just how it is. And then they have zones. Uh, all zones are considered from each other. Okay. Uh, deck, separate. Hand, separate. Play, separate. Inkwell, separate. Discard is separate. The bag, they said, isn't really a zone. But, yeah, right here. All other zones the back isn't a physical zone. But it is only where triggered abilities created by the game wait to resolve. That's fine. Uh, keywords, we all know all these keywords already, but they're here in the manual. And that's it. That is my really, really quick guide of the comprehensive rules. I like it. I like it a lot. And one of my goals in this game is to become a judge. I would love, love to be a judge. So I'm going to be memorizing this whole thing. And then when they do judge tests, I'm going to be applying. And I cannot wait. That's going to be fun. What do you guys think about the rule manual now that we've gone through it? Does it answer your questions? Does it actually cause more questions? Let me know what you guys think in the comments, and I will see you guys later. Bye!